your body is always in the present moment, but your mind your, can travel into the past or, or the future. So it can be somewhere, somewhere else, but using your body as an anchor, the sensations in your body as an anchor, can really um, bring you into the moment. And there's that mind-body connection. So when you start to really notice what's happening in your body, there's that union between what's happening mentally and what's happening physically. You're listening to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast, the show that blends science and heart to bring you evidence-based tips and tricks for cultivating a healthy, wealthy, and meaningful life. Now, here's your host, therapist, yogi, and fellow full life balancer, Dr. Caitlin Harkis. Hi there, welcome back to Wisdom for Wellbeing. I have a very interesting interview for you today with Kathy Overy. So Kathy is going to talk to you about all things yoga, psychology, and neuroscience. She bridges modern science with classical yoga to enhance the transformational effects of contemporary mind-body practices. She works both one-on-one and in group settings, supporting clients that have experienced stress, anxiety, complex trauma, PTSD, and eating disorders. So Kathy's completed her PhD in psychology and has over 13 years of academic research experience. During that time, she published research and lectured on topics such as emotional memory, personality psychology, biological psychology, behavioral neuroscience, cognition, and molecular biology. She's held research positions in both New Zealand, the US, Australia, and she has transitioned to working with yoga. So she made the career shift because she thought she could be of greater benefit to people while being more aligned with her core passions. So she's been interested in the transformational effects of yoga and completed research on how beneficial yoga practices can be for mental health and well-being. Since 2016, she has completed over 700 hours of yoga teacher training and has actually transitioned to teaching yoga full-time. Being trained as a research scientist, she is really interested in yoga practices for which there's an evidence base facilitating the effectiveness of yoga. She is also a certified trauma-sensitive yoga facilitator. She was trained and supervised by the Center for Trauma and Embodiment at the Justice Research Institute. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to Kathy so that you can learn about different emotions, how they come up in your body, the default mode network, and using yoga as a connection to enhance your mind-body relationship. All right, here's Kathy now. So Kathy, welcome to Wisdom for Wellbeing. I am so delighted to have you here today and I've actually already introduced you to the listeners. What the listeners actually don't know is that this is the second introduction because <laughs> we had some technical issues so we've got an opportunity to practice all our yoga skills but since they didn't get to hear the first time, would you mind introducing yourself and what has brought you here today? Well, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, so I um, I have a background in psychology. Um, I have a PhD in psychology, and I uh, started uh, yoga around the same time that I started my PhD. And uh, so that happened, and then post PhD, I went into neuroscience research. So I had a few postdocs in different. Uh, countries in New Zealand and Australia uh, sort of focusing on behavioral neuroscience, so the link between behavior and what's happening in the brain. And that was good, you know, that was a few years of my life, sort of 13 years altogether of neuroscience research. And but as I said, when I started my PhD, I started practicing yoga and I um, got a real sort of taste for it and became quite curious about it. And I was watching sort of the research on yoga and I started to notice that there was a lot coming through sort of about mindfulness and yoga and the benefit for meditation, for emotion and stress reduction and, and just understanding consciousness, like what is the nature of the self and the mind. So um, really it's the interesting stuff. 
<laughs> so very deep philosophical questions, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. More yeah. science questions. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a broad subject. I remember um, I had some colleagues saying, "Won't you be bored when you go when you're just teaching yoga?" I'm like, oh, "No, I think I'll be okay." <laughs> it's definitely a few layers to yoga. Um, so yeah, I finished my last uh, postdoc, which um, was in Brisbane, and I towards the end of that, I started a trauma sensitive yoga training. So I, I really enjoyed that because it was a link between psychology and yoga, like a really quite a clear link. And so I started, um, I got that qualification, uh, certification, and then went out and started teaching yoga full time in 2016. So it wasn't all trauma sensitive yoga to start. I did a lot of work in uh, studios and still do sort of classic yoga, but with a trauma sensitive sort of spin to it. Um, which is really about introception, which I think we'll chat about today. And since, yeah, and since then, I um, started Ivy Yoga, which uh, was in about about a year ago. I really sort of decided I was going to jump into it and and um, try and bring yoga that has uh, sort of like an evidence base to it. So there's lots of different yoga methods and meditation styles and things. And there's research now, quite a lot of research now, demonstrating how helpful it can be for mental health, well-being, or um, sort of thriving. And so I wanted to bring this to, to people because I noticed working in studios, you get a, a broad range of people coming in. Some people that are just there for the physical practice, which is totally fine. Uh, but then some who are there for sort of psychological support or stress reduction, or they want some sort of psychological shift. So I wanted to have some sort of um, avenue that people could pursue, uh, you know, something more specialised. So that's where Ivy Yoga was born, and that's where I am now. That's incredible. So it's this journey from going from behavioural neuroscience and through various postdocs and different areas of research to finding your heart in yoga and then starting to look at trauma-sensitive yoga, which connected the dots in all of these areas of expertise for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and especially because my PhD was on emotion, so emotional memory, um, so trauma memory um, being having a huge emotional component to it I, it really gelled for me so yeah absolutely would you actually mind maybe explaining that because I think that will really set the stage understanding what is this emotional memory that we store in our bodies and what is behavioral neuroscience generally? <laughs> <laughs> okay so my um so I guess I come from a real basic research background. So what that means is looking at fundamental mechanisms. So for example, my PhD was looking at um, how a, a fear memory is created in the brain and looking at how, uh, so when a fear memory is created, you get a network of cells that strengthen their connection within each other. So it's like um, sort of attaching information together. So we would use a, a basic sort of Pavlovian conditioning paradigm where um, we would use animals as a model we use rats and um, they would be exposed to a, um, a tone or a um, or a light like a very basic stimulus and then that would be paired with a, a foot shock and um, from there we could start to uh, dive deeply into what was happening in their brains um, during that period so what how did they learn to associate these these um, things together and so the, the fear with an emotional memory the idea is that um, it's strong like our, our behaviors are driven by emotions be them positive emotions or negative emotions and if it's something like fear that's a uh, emotion that's quite adaptive because it teaches us to stay away from something that's life-threatening. So it has a huge um, sort of impact when you experience it. And the memories that you form around that experience are really strong. So because it's adaptive, so if you're ever in that situation again, and you're like there's a, you know, that cue or that person or whatever it is that's the trigger for you, you go into a response which is your your being, your body sort of saying, this is not a safe place for you to be. And it creates that sort of fight or flight um, response. And um, so, yeah, that was the fear memory side of it. 
But well, that I think really normalizes like how when we experience a strong emotion, how hard it is not to behave in certain ways. Mm. So I guess there's this like action urge, isn't there, that comes with that with that emotion? Mm. And you said memory network. <laughs> mm, absolutely. And we would talk about it. Um, not that you would learn to associate say a stimulus like a neutral stimulus with a fearful stimulus what you're actually learning to associate is the the neutral stimulus with the feeling of fear so it's all it's all emotional it's all driven by by emotion yeah yeah um and then you mentioned the body side of things with that so when you people experience fear um be it during the formation or of the fear memory or like during a trauma event, um, that has a huge body component. So your body can go into a fight or flight response, sort of getting you ready to try and get out of that situation. And those feelings can be huge, like overwhelming. I mean, people throw around the word, word trauma a lot, like, oh, that was really traumatizing. But I'm, I'm pretty pleased to say that I don't think a huge number of us have actually experienced real trauma, like the real gut-wrenching feeling of trauma, thankfully. Yes, um, thankfully indeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, those feelings are intense. And for someone to, to survive that, sometimes they dissociate from the feeling. Like it becomes so overwhelming, so they dissociate from, from those body sensations. Um, so that can happen during the event. Or afterwards, say they're triggered um, and they're in a situation where it's potentially quite safe, but there's some sort of trigger there that brings them back to where they were in that, in that past experience. And again, they've got these strong feelings that they have to try and cope with in order, they might be in the shopping mall or something like that, or just driving their car and they've got to sort of suppress them, get past them just to move through what they're doing right now. So they're suppressing those body feelings in order to cope. Um, and people can experience sort of a shutdown response as well. So uh, during the event or after the event where um, it just becomes so overwhelming, their nervous system starts to sort of shut down. And that's where we head into sort of more polyvagal theory. So these are, what I'm talking about, I guess, is all these sort of emotional body-based reactions that go along with, uh, with trauma and with fear that um, people live with. And in order to live with them, they they can try and sort of dissociate from them. And with practice, they become quite good at it. So, and, that, and that's a survival mechanism for them to be able to sort of carry on with their, with their life post the trauma. So dissociating or in some way shutting down these feelings is a way of carrying on and moving on. But it sounds like these feelings are still embedded in the being, in the memory networks, in the, the body's physiology. Would you be able to share a bit about this and its connection to what you would call embodied yoga practices? Absolutely. So this is heading more into um, probably trauma-sensitive yoga, but um, I all good so trauma sensitive yoga uh, it's very invitational it can be uh, quite basic movements as well and the idea behind that is it gives people the opportunity to uh, move based in ways that they choose to move uh, so for example in a session we might say um, you might choose to to lift your arms up um, parallel to the floor or another option that you might have is to have your arms close to your body and so there's no sort of right or wrong or more advanced or anything like that it's just giving people an opportunity to make a choice in their bodies and the idea behind that really is just allowing them to explore body sensations at their own pace so for some people lifting their arms up away from their body is actually quite a triggering feeling and so they have the opportunity to explore that feeling uh, if they want to if in, a, in a safe sort of environment in that, in that session, that yoga class. And, uh, and then to feel those feelings, to feel body sensations. Um, because it's, it's pretty well known now 
uh, that her body aspect to the, I think it was some research in 2014 on um, body maps of emotion where people were asked to, it's like 200 or I don't know, maybe even 700 people, a huge study, um, people were asked to draw where they feel emotion in the body and uh, things like love and hate and fear and happiness and they would draw them in different places. So, you know, so as we do these sort of embodied yoga practices, we're feeling parts of our body that are associated with, with emotions. Um, so, yeah. And it sounds like it would be different for everyone. If everyone's drawing their body map a little bit different, I guess this would mean that you, as perhaps a yoga instructor or, you know, therapists, maybe getting people to do some um, paired movement in a therapy session, it would be different for everyone what comes up then. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, that's, I think that's you really hit the nail on the head there that everyone's so different and um, how people react to different things is, is you know, different. You know, we have these different experiences and so um, the sessions, those particular types of sessions tend to be quite small, just eight or so people and um, you really do get a whole variety of movement going on. So you have people that might be in a child shape um, people that are you know, their arms up, their arms down. It's you know people exploring at their own pace as they start to to feel comfortable doing so, and um, and then from there, uh, it, it's often it used to be strongly recommended that people were in therapy at the same time that they're doing trauma sensitive yoga. But the um, the trauma sensitive yoga I do is by uh, the trauma center in Brookline, Massachusetts, so TCTSY. But they've changed their, their regulations uh, just to make it more available because they realize that people um, can't wait for therapy, like a, a talk therapy. Um, but they're still strongly re recommended that people have support while they do this sort of trauma sensitive yoga because as they start to, to drop in and notice body sensations, this is when they can start to, to notice things they haven't noticed before. They can start to become, they can start to be triggered again, things that they've learned to suppress. Um, and also the joy of it is actually start to feel more positive emotions as well. Because if you're dampening down your negative emotions, it's not just a one-way street. You can also dampen down your ability to feel your positive emotions. So that's, that's outside of my scope of practice. I'm not a, a, a therapist, but the people I tend to see are seeing therapists at the same time. So they come and they practice some yoga. They don't have to talk about their experience with me. It can just be something that's happened. You know, they can just feel their own experience. And then if they want to talk it with, about it with someone else, then they go off to their therapist or a support network and, and process it further. So it sounds to me like you mentioned that sometimes things come up in these practices that people didn't necessarily know were there. So I imagine in any sort of a yoga class, whether it's trauma sensitive or not, in moving your body in a particular manner and your body being different to someone else's, you might come across things that have you feeling all the feels. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have a personal story to, that I can share about that. Um, when I was first starting yoga, I, I had a fight with my ex-boyfriend at the time. I thought, I'll go to yoga. And you know, it was really nice and relaxing, the idea of yoga being off I went. And partway through the session, I started crying. And it wasn't like it, you know, sometimes you feel like you're going to cry and you can kind of hide it or dampen it down, <laughs> strangely enough, as I'm speaking about it. But it came out. It just came out. I just had this shift, this emotional sort of, outpouring I didn't know what was happening it was the first time I've ever experienced that connection between moving my body and having an emotional reaction I was like embarrassed and people were looking and I was like there's something pretty awesome pretty magical about a yoga practice to be able to tap into something that I was trying to sort of suppress at the time um, and out it came so yeah and I see that in like just my general yoga classes as well People start moving and they're like, I'm crying and I don't know why. Like, well, you've really okay. normalized the experience, but also I noticed you use the word sort of saying it's amazing. And I wonder if for some people, like feeling all those feelings, crying in a session and movement might not feel so amazing. What would be yeah. the benefit of tapping into these feelings, maybe in sort of a titrated, a slow manner? Like what's happening in the brain as you do this? <laughs> and how could you keep um, yourself safe emotionally as well? <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it's really 
you got to you got to be you got to feel that you're in a safe environment and a lot of people who um or well, some people that are going to yoga they've, they've they're in a class where they trust the teacher and um and it's a safe healing space for them and when you're in that space and you've got permission and you know that that sort of thing can happen that it's normal like you're saying it's normalized um i've had students that just say look i i just want to feel it i just want to be in that for a moment or i have students who um who have just told me afterwards that they were they were crying but i didn't notice at the time but um they it's sort of just, I guess it's it's just the choice. That's the aspect of the the trauma sensitive yoga, especially, or just having any sort of trauma or awareness or any awareness that there's emotion connected to a yoga practice. As a teacher, just knowing that that can happen is, um, you know, supportive for for the for the students and allowing them just to have their experience. And it doesn't have to mean anything. And that's the joy of it. It's not like a therapy session where you might, I'm not a therapist, so I'm just <laughs> kind of guessing what happens where you might try and um, add some sort of meaning to it. Okay, so what does it mean for you? Why, why, what happened? You know, it doesn't have to happen like that in a yoga class. You can just experience it. And there's no, you don't have to go further at that point. It can just be the emotion, just the emotion as it is. And they talk about that in, in trauma, especially that sometimes, uh there isn't a coherent story anyway that a trauma memory can be quite disjointed so just um you know there's there's no pressure i guess when you you're feeling those emotions you can just let them you can just feel them and let them be um as far as what's happening in the brain with trauma sensitive yoga which really taps into um or any invitational style of yoga i keep saying trauma sensitive but when i say that just think any sort of invitational style of yoga um, we'll think of it broader really, as something where you've yeah, got an option yeah. or an invitation for how you move yeah 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 and you have you're allowed to sort of or you've dropped into your own own sort of feelings and making those choices um they've shown that there one particular brain area that's affected is the insular cortex and the insular cortex is involved in feeling body sens sensations, so interoception, uh, which is yeah, essentially that ability to feel what's happening. Um, and they've shown that as a result of, uh, of trauma in particular, there's reduced activi activity in the insular cortex. And through that sort of invitational style of language at Trauma Sensitive Yoga, then there's actually an increase in activity in that, that area, so a recovery of activity and um, so it just shows that at a sort of a brain level and neurobiological level people are starting to feel more in their bodies um, through the practice so it's and not just being able to move into a deeper posture or to feel stronger in your body it's literally changing what's happening in regards to your brain's formation yeah and your ability to to feel and that's not just trauma sensitive yoga i was looking at some research from 2015 if you're interested in this sort of stuff there's a researcher his last name's fab farb he's done a lot of research on mindfulness and yoga and interoception and, and i can put a link to this in the show notes for all the listeners who are going what was that yeah. and if you're driving don't worry check out the show notes yeah. and it'll be there. <laughs> yeah absolutely i'd love to share this stuff um he has done a lot of work i hope it's a he it could be a she sometimes it's hard when you're reading these um, manuscripts um, they've, they have done a lot of work looking at um, yeah interception and mindfulness so um, it's not necessarily again in the trauma space but just um, mindfulness and they talk about um, mindfulness having those same changes so people the activity and brain areas associated with feeling body sensations become sort of more enhanced so through a mindfulness practice, um, through that sort of meditative practice, people again start to feel more of their bodies. And I talk about it with regards to, uh, I think I need to sort of tell you a little bit about what happens to your brain when you're, you're meditating and when you're not. So the idea is that, um, it's not really an idea, it's well known, but the, the concept is that when you are not really doing anything, you're, and you're just sort of idly thinking about whatever you want to think about, 
uh, you go into what's called a default mode network. So it's part of your brain that's all sort of about self-referencing, thinking about the future or the past, thinking about conversations you've had with someone. You know those thoughts that you just have when you're like, oh, I'm just waiting for the bus or something like that, all those, that sort of mind-wandering kind of stuff. And then uh, through mindfulness practice, uh, the mindfulness practice I was talking about in this particular study was um, just noticing sensations without giving them like a label, like just noticing without judgment or anticipation. So they showed that there was, uh, through that practice, that there was a reduction in uh, brain activity in the default mode. So people were less likely to be sort of self-referencing and more activity towards noticing body sensations. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because your body is always in the present moment, but your mind your, can travel into the past or, or the future. So it can be somewhere, somewhere else, but using your body as an anchor, those sensations in your body as an anchor can really um, bring you into the moment. And there's that mind-body connection. So when you start to really notice what's happening in your body, there's that union between what's happening mentally and what's happening physically, and which is interesting considering one of the definitions of yoga is union. So, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Poetic. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder, Kathy, like you mentioned that the mindfulness was around body sensation, and you also mentioned that when you're doing the, you know, for instance, invitational style of yoga where you're noticing what's going on in your body and responding or moving accordingly that in a way sounds like mindful movement so it sounds like it is a style of mindfulness itself but we're bringing some some physical action into this practice too absolutely yeah that's exactly it and I think I I like to gravitate towards that physical side of like a physical meditative practice uh, yeah a physical meditative practice for the best way to say it. I like I like that because of what I just said that because the body sensations are, your body is in the now, you know, and that's such an easy anchor to drop into and um, well, easier than some things anyway. And, and I guess it's quite common for people to start with um, like a breathing meditation because uh, the breath moves and your mind focuses more on movement. But then that, that go, goes along with uh, with yoga as a moving meditation so giving you something to focus on that's in the moment that's, that's moving that can hold your your attention that's incredible to be able to have that anchor as you describe it and you know our breath goes with us everywhere our bodies go with us everywhere what a powerful skill to be able to drop in and notice absolutely yeah, How absolutely. does this relate that the default mode network and is that different to, I guess, the, the fear network that might have been developed when there was a stimulus that someone might have experienced in their past, in their history, again, linking it back to trauma and some of the work that you've done around emotional experiences and how that changes our brain. Would, would yeah. you be able to talk I, us through that connection if there is one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, when we self-reference, often um, it can be negative. It's um, quite common for us to focus on, on negative feelings. And um, the amygdala network is the one that I was studying. So I was studying uh, how memories of amygdala-based sort of emotional memories are formed. But the amygdala is more than just fear. It's um, you know, some of those sort of negative feelings as well, as well as positive feelings, but it's always the negative ones that really stand out because of that. And just for listeners who might not have heard the word amygdala before, yeah. it's a <laughs> part of the brain, isn't it, where it has um, a particular function in emotions. And as you were saying, particularly around strong, um, scary yeah. or negative, we would call yeah. them maybe negative emotions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those negative feelings. Um, just to put it in perspective, it's part of... Um, a sort of a subcortical area, the, the limbic system. So um, sometimes it's referred to as being part of the sort of the primitive brain. Um, so it's, it works by itself. You don't need to be consciously aware. It, its job is actually to work a lot faster than you are consciously aware to, to get you out of danger before you can really think about it. Um, so yeah, that's the amygdala. And it's 
its name actually comes from um, the Latin word for almond, which makes it easier to remember. So it's an almond shaped structure. Anyway, I digress back to the. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll have a visual. I like it. <laughs> yeah. A little almond. almond with a scary face <laughs> <Yeah>. on it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, yeah, so self-referencing sometimes it's easier to think about the bad things that have happened or um, things that we don't like about our behavior or, or things that, you know, anything that you might just give a negative connotation to. And it's easier to notice those things because you're starting to tap into that adaptive network that is designed to, to pull your attention towards things that aren't good for you. And, um, and with that knowledge, once you're aware of them, then you can sort of move away from them. But it's so easy just to get caught in this, the amygdala's ability to shine a light on the negative and get stuck there and, um, and not be able to sort of move away from those negative thoughts. And the idea with um, mindfulness is to, to have the ability to sort of step back from that normal brain process of shining the light on the negative and allowing you to just see it as what it is, a natural part of your physiological processing and, um, and then just to see it without judgment or anticipation. Instead of having, again, more self-reflection, you're like, oh, I'm thinking those negative thoughts again, I can't stop this. This is, you know, it gives you a moment to go, hey, this is just my brain doing what it does and it's normal. It's designed to do that, it, you know, but um, I, can, I can see that now and I can choose how I want to, to res respond to it. That's really powerful to be able to see what your brain is doing as a normal experience and to be able to step back from that rather than judging yourself or beating yourself up or engaging in yeah. this sort of yeah. internal civil war like battle with, with yourself when your brain is, as you said, doing yeah. something normal. So it sounds like it's like yeah. this um, metacognitive awareness and by meta, I mean, awareness Absolutely. of what's happening at the level below so awareness of your thinking processes in a way that's much more open and, and kind yeah absolutely I guess it was interesting because I got into psychology because I wanted to study um, memory because I was like memories are everything they're what make us and they do but then I realized actually that's just um, you know, a process a memory is just a process and what makes us is how we Kind of respond to it it gets very messy like you're saying because then how you respond to it is also a memory it's very complex but um yeah just to know that like, memories go on oh i was just gonna say it sounds like the memories can be in your body as well yeah yeah so feeling that's true actually um so feeling those emotions that taps into the william james theory of emotion it's been around for a while and it's being contentious at some times but it keeps coming back this theory of emotion so William James he was a very famous American psychologist like a, a grandfather of, of psychology and um, he came up with William the James Lang theory of emotion so he came up with this theory that um, emotions start in the body so you might have like a sort of a sweaty palm or you feel your heart racing and then how you uh, sort of appraise that sensation. So what you notice about it and what you add to it is the feeling of the emotion. So there's a difference between the emotion and the feeling. So, for example, let's say you're in a situation and you feel your heart racing and you're like, oh, my heart's racing. I'm nervous. So you have created that link between the physiological feeling of like heart racing, sweaty palms. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm nervous. Or the same person or a different person, same sort of feeling, my heart's racing, oh, I'm excited. Like a different yeah. appraisal to different. this. Yeah, yeah. So That's the really idea, powerful. It is, it is. So the idea is that yeah, emotions are feelings in the body, but our, our feelings are actually the combination of what we make of those feelings. 
So then being able to notice what's happening in your physical body and being able to notice what happens in the mind is your key to creating a new relationship or an openness to these experiences in a different manner than you might have had um, in the past. Absolutely. So if we talk about that sort of mindfulness practice about noticing things without judgment or anticipation, say you're in a situation and you, you feel your heart racing, it's like, this is my heart racing. It doesn't have to be like, oh my God, I'm nervous and this is a, you know, it's a bad situation. It's just like, oh, if I look around, it's okay, I'm safe. It's just my heart racing. But to, like you said, to be aware, to notice. Yeah. Yeah. So how does that help in healing from trauma or, you know, different mental disorders that people might have that might be embodied in their experience when they show up on the yoga mat? How does the healing take place from the trauma sensitive or invitational sort of model? Yeah, I guess it's about, with regards to trauma sensitive, it's about bringing people into the moment. So those triggers that they're feeling, so uh, they might be again in that situation, they're driving the car or in the supermarket, if they have a trigger, um, they go into a fear response. But to, to have that ability, and I've had students say this to me, to notice the surface underneath them, to notice their connection to the ground, and like, okay, I'm in the, present moment and I'm okay and so it gives them that skill to notice I'm being triggered and then to to use something the anchor of body sensations maybe not the triggering ones but something else or something that like I said the surface underneath you just to bring you into the moment be like it's okay I'm in a safe place yeah so it allows you to check in with where you are at this moment in time. So like feel the feelings, but it, as you kind of described before, kind of notice that as an experience and then to check in and reorientate to somewhere like the earth, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Whatever, whatever feels, um, whatever they choose. And the joy of it is that we don't teach it as um, notice the surface underneath you and you'll feel okay. Uh, we just give them options to explore in the yoga class and most of the time they discover it themselves they find things that work for them and that I think is so empowering because like I was saying people have different experiences so for whatever reason maybe noticing the surface underneath them is triggering so you, if you said to someone just notice the surface underneath you or just take slow breaths and everything will be okay but you just don't know what someone's trigger is so it's giving them the opportunity in the yoga class to explore, again, without expectations that something's going to um, sort of fix them, so to speak, and just letting them notice for, their, for themselves what, what they feel in different shapes and then using that information that no one's told them, they've discovered it themselves, using that information when they, when they need it. And I think that's the most powerful part of it is that, they really, dare I say, embody it. They really get to to experience it at a deeper level rather than someone saying, you know, if you're feeling stressed out, you just need to take some deeper breaths. That's just that's such a mental thing. But, you know, to actually have that opportunity to explore in a yoga class, feel what different shapes mean for them, and then to use those feelings when they need them, I think is. Yeah, that sounds incredibly powerful. And what you described, you mentioned the word introception earlier, being able to notice what's happening in your body. In a way, it becomes one's own self-regulatory experience because you can notice what you're feeling and notice what has worked for you in this situation or in the past to be able to self-soothe then. Yeah, yeah, if that's, yeah if that's what you want to do at the time, exactly, yeah. What what could we give listeners, I guess, as a takeaway? Like what could people go perhaps and practice now to be able to get some of these concepts in a way that might be safe? Like do you have any ideas for how people could start an invitational yeah. movement practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just created a video on this the other day, so it's fresh in my mind. I was so, just saying, talking. Listeners, we'll, yeah. we'll link to your video as well. So I'll be two ways of learning this. <laughs> Yeah, um, when we approach a yoga practice, we can, this is a psychological term, we can do it with an external or an internal frame of reference. And a internal frame of reference is what we were talking about. It's about feeling body, your experience, your body sensations or whatever experience you're having 
and knowing that you can use that experience to guide your practice. I'll just quickly give you the opposite, the external frame of reference, just so you can get an idea of the difference. The reference is when you look for sort of authority outside of your body. So in a yoga class, that might be trying to replicate a pose that you see someone else doing, even though their body shape and proportions, their practice could be quite different, but just going, that's how I need to practice, that's how it needs to be, I need to look like that. That's using an external authority. Um, the other external authority can sometimes be the way teachers facilitate a class. So a teacher might offer a correction and say, this is, you know, you need to do this to make the pose correct. And the real aspect there is your experience, not the external um, objective opinion of your practice. So I guess the takeaway message there is for anyone, and this is great for, for trauma sensitive or just for deepening a mind-body connection, for anyone, just know that you can drop in and move based on your own experiences. Even if you find yourself in a class that it, it feels that it's being pushed more towards an external sort of frame of reference, know that um, when you drop in and practice based on your own present moment experiences, that's where the powerful healing happens. That's where you build that mind-body connection and you, you create changes in your brain so that you are more aware of what's happening in your body and more mindful of what's happening for you. That sounds like a really beautiful reminder that we can yeah. be present with what's happening for us and allow ourselves the opportunity to connect in with our own wisdom, so to speak, rather than seeking yeah. the guidance yeah. externally. Yeah, I need to just add that there, you know, for safety reasons, there's definitely an element of guidance in some yoga practices, especially with like some of the more advanced poses and, you know, a teacher will offer corrections, but and that's, that's good, but I guess the real takeaway message is just to notice whether those corrections work for you. And they don't have to. And no teacher really knows um, your inner workings more than you do. So they can offer something and you can go, hey, that actually doesn't feel any better. It feels worse. So you always have, yeah, you have that power. But more often than not, when there's a really good teacher, they'll offer a correction. You're like, ah, I like that. You know, so, but then you've made the choice still, even though you're being facilitated and guided, you still, you're empowered to make that choice. That's a beautiful reminder for all of us in probably more situations than just yoga, isn't it? We can yeah. take the options that someone provides us, we can try them out. And if they feel true and useful and helpful and healthful, then we stick with them. And if they don't, then we can shift course again and reorientate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just know that that's normal, you know, like not everyone, we're also different, not everyone um, finds benefit in all the practices and it's the joy of, of yoga and there's all those different styles and different meditation practices and um, it's just a case of trying them out, trying them out for size and see if they work for you and, and yeah, and when they do, it's fantastic and if they don't, that's still information, you still learn something, it's still fantastic. So there's a few takeaways then that we can get onto the yoga mat or, you know, a mindfulness practice, whether it's mindful movement or various elements and start to connect in with ourselves to notice what's going on for ourselves, to start to notice what feels like it's helpful for us and skills that we could then use if we're starting to feel dysregulated at different points in time. And that this practice is actually cultivating introception, like an awareness of what is happening in our bodies which is quite empowering in terms of being able to notice the emotion as it's arising which isn't necessarily the same as a feeling but noticing yeah. the physical sensational experience of an emotion yeah. and then deciding what to do next yeah yeah and then that's so powerful because then you develop that sense of agency that self-regulation go okay this is what I'm going to do and Oh, what's more healing than that, you know, having that power to to heal yourself, so to speak, to find the things that work for you. I think that's amazing. So we'll ask all the listeners a little bit of movement now, whether you're walking and it's sort of like rolling your shoulders, noticing what's happening there or, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever you can do while you're driving and just allowing yourself to observe and to reorientate accordingly. And then where can listeners find you, Kathy? 
Yeah. My best place to find me is um, via my website, so it's ivyyoga.com.au, and I'm often posting this sort of information on the blog there and um, different classes and things like that coming up. So that's definitely the, the place to to find me and um, you can subscribe and stay up to date with all my musings and offerings. So, yeah. That's fantastic. And we'll link to, um, to your Ivy yoga website in the show notes, um, as well as the videos that you've mentioned and yeah. we'll put in your social media connections as well. So people can reach out in different formats and continue right. this conversation. Absolutely. I really appreciate that. And I, yeah, I, as you can tell, I love talking about it. So, you know, if you're a student that just wants to know more about it or a teacher, I'm always open to, to chatting. Love it. Thank you for that invitation, Kathy. And thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom today. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that interview with Kathy as much as I did. I think it's a really interesting exploration about how your body really supports mindfulness, how your body is the now. And being able to utilize movement is a really incredible tool to be able to connect in with yourself. I thought it was a really interesting point that we have these different frames of references that influence our experience. So perhaps you will head on over to the yoga mat find your way to the now. And if you have enjoyed this episode, please feel free to reach out. Let us know via social media. Of course, connect with Kathy and all of the amazing work that she's doing, ivyyoga.com.au. And I'll put the links to all of her social media, as well as her more recent YouTube video on enhancing the benefits of yoga in the show notes at drcaitlin.com. See you next week. Be well. Thanks for joining us this week on the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. Please visit drcaitlin.com to connect, find show notes, other episodes, and to subscribe. While you're at it, if you find value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating or perhaps simply tell a friend about the show. Wisdom for Wellbeing is not a substitute for professional, individualized mental health treatment. If you are in crisis, please contact 000, your local emergency number if you are outside of Australia, or attend your local hospital ED.